Welcome to today's afternoon tea conversation. I'm Inge Borg, and I am the leader of Women in Global Health Norway. I want you to meet some of our members, especially those that are, have been appointed to our um, Women in Global Health Norway advisory group. So today I'm looking forward to having a cup of virtual tea with Ingvild Heisog Nedberg, midwife and PhD student from the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway. I always enjoy going to the exotic city of Tromsø, Ingvild, although this time around we're sharing a cup of tea almost 2,000 miles apart. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to do this. Really looking forward to it. Yes, I am looking forward to learning more about you too. Um, you're presently writing about cesarean sections in your PhD. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you ended up here from becoming a midwife to pursuing a PhD. I graduated as a midwife in 2010 uh, here at the University of, of Tromsø uh, after I traveled and, and studied abroad for, for several years. Um, and then after working for a couple of years, both in, in Norway and in South Sudan for Doctors Without Borders, um, I did a Master of Public Health, um, also here in Tromsø. Um, and I really enjoyed working as a midwife, um, especially uh, with the births themselves. Um, and I particularly liked the births where the women could sort of own their experience and I could sort of step back um, and uh, observe and just intervene when I really had to. Uh, and where women could sort of afterwards say like, you know, I'm really tough. I did this, I did this on my own mm -hmm. uh, and together with their partner. Uh, and I think that's the experience that every woman should have after giving birth, regardless of how it turns out, whether it's by forceps or cesarean section or water birth at home, you did it and it's something that you will remember forever. Uh, so I think my intrinsic uh, motivation for working in maternal health, regardless if it has been with couples in labor or uh, digging into numbers for my PhD, um, is that as many women as possible should, above all, survive going through pregnancy and childbirth, number one, but also that they should be left with um, an experience where they feel that they were respected and where their questions uh, were taken seriously, that their concerns were taken seriously, um, and that they were informed about what was going on, so that no matter how their birth turned out, uh, it would not stand in their way of bonding with the baby, growing as a family and basically continuing being a woman out in the world and uh, ideally also feel empowered from, from the experience. Um, and then I, when I did my master degree, I, I wrote my master thesis um, on a birth registry in Northwest Russia. Um, and it was my first introduction to how uh, a registry works, uh, to quantitative methods, which is not something that people from the health science normally have a lot of um, background in or knowledge about. Um, and we, I generalize now a bit, but uh, we might tend to be a bit scared of statistics uh, at times. Um, and it was also an introduction to really understanding and reading a lot of scientific literature. Um, and I really liked it. Uh, it was nice to sort of being able to uh, lift my gaze from, from the labor ward up to the population level and really see how practice actually affect outcomes on, on a large scale. And that's the beauty of, of registers. Um, so, when I'd finished my master thesis, I was very lucky to be able to continue with both maternal health and global health and epidemiology uh, through my PhD, um, because uh, my supervisor was contracted to establish the Georgian National Birth Registry. Um, they wanted a birth registry modeled on the Norwegian 
um, which has been around for 50 plus years now. So it's considered one of the, um, yeah, one of the best and most well-established uh, birth registries in the world. Um, so I was able to be part of that team. Um, and when we started looking into sort of preliminary numbers and uh, what was going on in Georgia, it very quickly became evident that their cesarean section rate close to 50% was both a concern for maternal health, but um, also of obviously of scientific interest. And uh, that's why I, I chose to, to go into it because I could sort of continue a bit with what I've been doing before. And with my background as a midwife, it, um, it really made me curious why a country would have almost one of the highest cesarean section rates in the world um, at that time. And especially coming from a country like Norway where we, we've had low and stable cesarean section rates um, uh, for decades now. So that was sort of my, yeah, my way into it. Um, so it means that I've in the past uh, three and a half years, I've gotten to know the, the country of Georgia quite well. Um, I, I used to go there regularly before this pandemic kind of shut everything down and I hope to be able to continue going there when, when we are allowed to. So how is this related to over-medication of pregnancy and childbirth and, and why is over-medication a problem? Um, again, I can go back to, to my personal experience and why I got interested in this because uh, quite early on as a midwifery student, it struck me that I sometimes experienced that there was a discrepancy between what I was taught by my teachers and what I read in the books and what I experienced in the different labor wards in, in the region. And that experience was that midwives and doctors um, sometimes intervened a bit more or sometimes a lot more than they were supposed to or had to just to be on the safe side. Um, although the, the woman in question did not sort of tick any boxes of, uh, of risk factors. And this struck me even more as a midwifery student, I spent three months in, in Palestine uh, where the threshold for what was considered a high risk pregnancy and a high risk birth was much, much lower than compared to what I was um, used to from, from back home. Um, and which again resulted in much uh, higher rates of intervention and diagnosis. Um, and this was not because the, the women in Palestine were so much sicker or older or their living conditions were so much different from the women in Norway. So there were really other um, factors at play. Um, and this interest in why pregnancy and childbirth are treated so differently around the world, why intervention rates uh, are so different from healthcare system to healthcare system, uh, while women in the end are more or less the same. And, and this this interest kind of stayed with me um, throughout my, my years as a, as a midwife. And I think that the, if you go into um, a meeting with midwives and, and doctors, the, the talk will much often more be about what we didn't do and what we didn't check than that we intervened too much or that we did too much. And, and I think there are many reasons why this is happening, but but part of it is due to the over-medicalization of, of pregnancy and childbirth. And, and with that, I mean the process of unnecessary interventions um, that will not improve outcomes and in the worst case can, can actually cause uh, mortality and morbidity for the woman and, and the newborn. Yeah. So do you see that this is a difference between um, what's taking place in high resource uh, countries and low resource countries? I mean, that must, that, does that play an important part in your PhD? Um, well, it's uh, Georgia and Norway are, are kind of good examples of exactly that, how um, the highest rates of interventions are, actually, are not found in high income countries. Um, so, for example, the Nordic countries and 
the Netherlands uh, stand out as having very low intervention rates during pregnancy and childbirth. Um, while it's actually in uh, low income and middle income countries that, that we see the highest rates and also the largest um, discrepancies within the country. Um, so the countries with the highest, for example, cesarean section rates uh, today are, are mostly in, in Central America and, and South America um, and parts of the Middle East. Um, with, I think it's the Dominican Republic leading the way now with almost 60% national average cesarean section, uh, while the Nordic countries are um, between 15 to, to 18%. So it's not, um, there are, it's sort of the system around that creates um, the, how can you say, the, the opportunities to either reduce or increase um, the intervention rates. And I think part of the, the explanation why we are seeing it mostly in, in low and middle income countries is that for decades there's been a, a great emphasis on moving births from the home where they've traditionally taken place um, up until quite recently into facilities. Mm with the belief that this would uh, reduce uh, mortality and morbidity, and it, and it has by, by all means, because um, they, women would have access to, to qualified care, you would have access to, um, to medicines necessary to stop, uh, for example, bleeding um, and lower high blood pressure, which are the two main killers of, of mothers. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems that we, maybe have um, lost something on the way or that we have gone a bit overboard because we are ending up treating everyone the same so to speak so you kind of just push all pregnant women into one category where we have to subject them to um, intervention that might be very suitable for women who tick the high risk category but is not suitable and can even be harmful for women who are considered low risk Right, right. I can actually relate to that as I tried to get a cesarean section for my last birth in Norway. That was literally impossible, so it never happened. <laughs> yes, and that's that's sort of the um, the balance here that we should. It's very important to respect the woman's wishes and uh, her worries and her questions, while at the same time we should not subject women to interventions that are not necessary and cesarean section is fantastic when you need it and it literally saves lives but with all kind of surgery um, it also implies um, a risk of complications both for the mother and the newborn and also in the subsequent pregnancy with all your experience and knowledge of focusing on on women and their health um, and and also now your role in Women in Global Health Norway. I'm really curious to know if you have some thoughts about uh, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, is there any new happenings with over-medicalization due to COVID-19? Yes, <laughs> unfortunately there is. Um, what we are seeing um, is that obviously most countries in the world has had to implement measures um, to keep infection rates down and to, to try to avoid um, COVID into the labor ward or the um, neonatal um, intensive care wards. Um, so countries have gotten to different lengths in, in how strict their measures are, um, but there have been reports coming out that several countries, uh, for example, are um, advocating that mothers and newborns are separated uh, up to two weeks um, without any symptoms, uh, that they are um, they're advising against breastfeeding at all, even though you have negative COVID tests. Um, and that uh, in some countries also that the cesarean section rate is, has gone up a lot in the belief that this is a way of reducing transmission um, of COVID, which, which is really not the case. Um, so 
there are several studies which have been published on this already and, and many more would follow. Um, and what, and also here in Norway in the last, especially couple of weeks, there's been a lot of media attention on how hospitals are, have reduced the presence of the, the partner um, of the women um, during labor. Mm. And I can also imagine if, um, what is the term when you are, uh, when your baby is born uh, very premature? Yeah. If it needs to be, uh, you know, if it's born uh, in week 25 or 26, it must be very hard. Yeah, some, some facilities are then uh, only allowing the mother to, to be present. So it has meant that several fathers have not met their newborns for, for several weeks, which I think everyone can understand is an extremely tough situation to be in. Mm -hmm. um, whether that is, I will not go into whether that has been a right or a wrong decision to make by the health facilities in question. But I think the sort of the, the general worry when I talk with my network in, in maternal health um, is that once the pandemic sort of not necessarily dies down, but at least is reduced, that uh, these measures will be kept in place simply because they are just easier uh, and maybe more cost effective uh, or maybe they don't have to involve so many people into the decision making process so that that you will continue to see high intervention rates or keeping mothers and, and babies uh, apart, for example, or that breastfeeding rates will continue to to go down also after the. Uh, the pandemic goes down that's sort of one main worry of this. Do you have yeah. any theories as to why the breastfeeding is going down? Because that does not make sense to me. Well, it was um, obviously early on in the pandemic, we we didn't know very much about the transmission and um, especially, uh, I mean, little has been done uh, on research on pregnant women and, and COVID. Uh, for example, that the vaccine has not been tested out on, on pregnant women, for example, which is which is now being done. So I, I think as sort of a precautionary measure, um, several guidelines said that, you know, we don't recommend breastfeeding either um, if you've been positive or if you have symptoms or at all in the worst case, just as a precautionary measure. And what we do know is that if you don't start breastfeeding um, in the first week, at least after birth, the chances that you will be able to, to catch that up later is very, very low. So if you have a bad start, um, the chances are that, that you will continue on infant formula thereafter, which is, I mean, in, in many countries, being on infant formula is, is not a problem in terms of increased morbidity because there's no problem, you know, sterilizing flasks and, and getting clean water and getting proper infant formula, but it is a problem in countries where those are not accessible. Yes, right. Uh, I'm afraid we have to turn back to, uh, to, 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 to our uh, Women in Global Health. I, the time is running, but I, because I would like to know uh, how you think there is a need for women in global health as a network and a society is, that regards itself uh, as having full equality like Norway? Yes, I've been, um, it didn't take me very long to, co to, know, to come up with two good arguments for that. Um, yes, we have definitely come a very long way in Norway. And I think, yes, some might question the need to have an all female fem uh, network. Um, but I would consider it especially relevant for two reasons. And the first one is that we can never and should never lead the struggle for gender equality on behalf of others. So meaning in, in other countries uh, and thinking what we know is best for others is a way of thinking that I hope we are done with by now or should be done with, but um, we can support, we can network, we can exchange ideas, and we can uh, draw attention to situations where 
attention is wanted. Uh, and that's why I think that the chapters of women in global health are just as relevant in countries where the equality situation is heavily skewed to countries where the situation has improved a lot in the last couple of decades um, in Norway. So I, I, I see that as an important role of women in global health Norway that by being a network and showing us to the world, we can um, yeah, provide support and provide uh, uh, being a partner when, when needed and when wanted to. So I think that's, that's an important argument. Um, and another argument is that achieving gender equality is not a final destination. And once we are done, we are there. And because changes in society can suddenly turn back progress uh, in one field of, of gender equality. And that's why I think we need to have these networks to, to sort of pay attention to what is going on. Um, and the closest example at hand is, is how this pandemic has set uh, lots of women back. Uh, for example, that the majority of part-time workers are women and therefore they are the most vulnerable to lose their jobs when employers have to, to cut staff. Uh, and also when schools and kindergartens have closed down, we have to juggle home office and, and childcare. And women are reported to take a much larger share of, of the burden, meaning that we are able to produce less uh, for our jobs. And, and as has been discussed previously, that um, publication, for example, of, uh, of female academics has gone down, while for male academics, this has increased. Right. So I think those are two arguments why women in global health Norway is definitely needed. Mm, very good. Thank you. Uh, and before we wrap up, Ingrid, do you have any advice uh, or, words or, or words of wisdom to our listeners? Uh, something you yourself would have liked to have heard when you entered your professional or yes, even student life? Um, I think I would uh, give two advice to those uh, who are studying. And first of all is um, don't think of studying as sort of a, a one time happening of your life and then you're done. Like get some work experience in between. Get out and know what's going on uh, because the reality on the ground is so different from the lecture halls. So go out and work for a bit, then go back in again. I mean, go into the universities again and, and, and study some more. I've, I've worked between all my degrees and it has really pointed me in the direction where I am today. And, and not least, it has really taught me what I didn't want to do if I thought this is, this is a good idea. And the second advice is that if you can get out of Norway <laughs> while studying or working, even just for a couple of months, on exchange, on a volunteer um, contract, whatever, do it. Because nothing will expand your mind more than just being dropped in a completely new setting and learn to navigate a new system. And it might not even be fun while you do it, but it can really open doors you never have thought about previously. So yeah, get out there once this uh, once we are vaccinated. That's my that's my advice. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much for sharing all your thoughts and reflections with us today. And uh, thanks to all our listeners for tuning in. Welcome back to the next uh, conversation that uh, will sure be happening anytime soon.